start to say good morning, but it's not, is it? Um, good afternoon, friends, fellow followers of Jesus, fellow Lenten journeyers. Let me begin by saying, as I always do when I have the chance to be here, my great thanks to Calvary, to Eileen in particular, for the warmth of your welcome. As I, again, I think I've said every time I've been here, this is such a gift to the city. And all of us who get to participate are grateful. And I am glad to be with you again today. We are on the cusp of Holy Week now. And I find myself captivated. It's nothing new for me to be captivated by a New Testament story, Bible nerd that I am. But I am captivated by one of the stories there where Jesus teaches us about practicing holiness rather than just celebrating it. We begin with Luke chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. So, we begin the story with Jesus sharing a meal in the home of a Pharisee, which might initially seem a bit surprising. But in Luke's telling of the story, the Pharisees at this point are still trying to figure Jesus out. Is he a, a nut? Is he a prophet? Is he a threat? They probably have their suspicions by now, but they don't really know. So one of them invites him to dinner. They need to figure him out. In the first, Medi first century Mediterranean world, the houses there could often be built with an opening in the back, opening onto the courtyard of the host so that the evening breezes could blow through. This Pharisee apparently lived in such a place. And there he gathered with his guests, all men, all of the same place in society as he was. Table rules were very clear. In that world, you ate with people like yourselves. Inviting Jesus, in fact, was a bit iffy. But they needed to figure him out, needed to determine maybe if maybe he belonged around their table. So they stretched the rules just a bit. Now those courtyards, the ones right in the back, often had an opening onto the street of the city that would run right beside the house, and this house apparently did. A circumstance which allows, as my dad liked to say, the plot to thicken. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. And then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. A woman who was in the city, a sinner. She was able to come in from the street and crash Simon's dinner party. The interpretations which you may have heard are probably correct. Though it's not definite, it's likely that she was a prostitute. She was therefore particularly unclean in that world and decidedly unwelcome at Simon's table. Well, as we might say in the South, right there in front of God and everybody, <laughs> she walked into Simon's house, right up to the dinner table where all those men were gathered, right up to Jesus, where, weeping, she did those remarkable things that Luke records for us. Everything about her in this moment is out of bounds and over the top, as we sometimes say. The risk she took entering the house, her behavior with Jesus, her emotion, her many tears, washing Jesus' feet with those tears, her gift of the ointment. From the vantage point that Luke gives us as readers of this story, we can see from this scene, how stunning her actions would have been to first century people, how shocking her actions actually were. But from the perspective of those Pharisees gathered around that table, the woman's behavior was not merely over the top. It was outrageous. I'll bet you've been in situations 
where somebody has said or done something that was experienced as entirely inappropriate and you have felt the discomfort level rise all over the room. Don't you know that was happening in this dining room? You likely also know how prone we are to look away from such awkward moments. So I wonder which of these men looked toward the doorway of the cooking area as if he needed to signal a servant girl to bring more food or drink, though nobody really wanted any. Others may have stared out at the courtyard, suddenly engrossed in watching nighttime settle over the city. Some of them may have needed to shift into a more comfortable eating position or suddenly get all those crumbs off their clothing. Anything, look anywhere, but the embarrassment unfolding, unfolding right in front of them. Meanwhile, the woman's behavior had likely cemented their judgment of her as grossly unclean. And since Jesus didn't recoil from her, that pretty much answered their questions about him. Now, when the Pharisee, Simon, who had invited Jesus, saw this happening, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Meaning, if Jesus knew, he would look away too. But he didn't, so he must not know, which means he's not a prophet. That's Simon's logic. I suspect at this point Simon was thinking now only about getting these two embarrassing people out of his house. Mission accomplished. We have learned what we needed to know. Now let's be done with it. Except that Jesus can be very annoying in that he does not cooperate with our sense of what ought to happen next. Instead of leaving a place where he was clearly no longer welcome, Jesus turned and announced to his host that it was now story time. When Simon agreed, don't you wonder how reluctantly, Jesus told a parable about two debtors, one of whom owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. So who loved more? Well, the debts were canceled. And then Jesus asked, so who loved more? And Simon knew, the one who had been forgiven more. And Jesus responded, you have judged rightly. And then Jesus said to Simon, do you see this woman? And this is where the story stops me cold. Do you see this woman? It's almost a funny question. After all, she is right in front of Simon in his own dining room. But of course the rub is, some of the time while she was there, he likely didn't see her at all, having turned his eyes away in his own discomfort. And when he did look at her, what he saw was a sinner. In Simon's world, a sinner was someone who didn't keep the rules of his community. Moral failures, perhaps, but also things like an inability to keep ritual cleanliness or to pay the temple tithe or knowing how to stay in your place. All of those things made a person a sinner in that world as well. So Simon saw a sinner someone unclean and unworthy of God or God's people, and she did not belong in his house. Simon hadn't seen the woman at all, which is why Jesus' question isn't funny at all. The great Buddhist teacher, Pema Chodron, says, we can be certain about who we are and who others are, and it blinds us. Our knowledge of this world tells us that had Simon seen her, he would have seen someone forced to make incredibly difficult choices in a harsh world. Maybe she was the fourth daughter in a poor family, which couldn't afford another dowry, so they couldn't arrange a marriage for her. 
So she was left to fend for herself in a world where women could hardly work outside of home and family. Maybe she was a widow and there was no family to take her in. Maybe she was barren or had only produced daughters or a disabled son and so she was divorced by her husband and cast out and if that happened, those children likely went with her. Maybe she'd been raped and no man would have her as a wife. Does anyone answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up with, I want to be a prostitute so I can be a, used like a soulless piece of flesh and despised by everybody I meet? I don't think so. One chooses prostitution when one's other choice is starvation, especially starvation for the children. It might be that if Simon had seen this woman, he would have had to see someone bearing with a nearly unbearable situation, which means that she was actually a strong, even a courageous woman. And had he seen her in that light, I don't know how he could have remained the same. For had he seen her, Simon would have been confronted by his own capacity to judge a suffering, courageous child of God as worthless. He would have seen how his world, comfortable enough for him, was forcing those kinds, these kinds of terrible choices on beloved children of God. He would have had to see that God was demanding his attention for in order for this woman's situation to change, Simon had to make some changes. And change for those who are uncomfortable is often unwelcome. Do you see this woman, Jesus asked, because Simon had not. But Jesus had. And as a result, his words to her are, your sins have been forgiven have been forgiven. She was living under God's grace already. The Greek verb, you're just going to have to trust me on this one. I'm not going to do a Greek lesson on you, right? The Greek verb clarifies that her forgiveness did not begin with Jesus' words. It had been happening already. And because Jesus, unlike Simon, was not bound by the rules of his society, he was free to see where God was operating in this woman's world. God knew the choices this woman had been making, and God knew why, and God did not hold those choices against her. Jesus offered her these comforting words, this comforting news. She lived under God's grace, and he did so, not least of which by seeing her. Do you see this woman, Jesus asked. And he asked it of someone who was among the most religious people of his day. Which makes the question awfully relevant to those of us gathered here this day. Priest and writer Barbara Brown Taylor has said in our time that reverence, being holy, is about paying attention which is pretty much what Jesus meant in this story by seeing. So, if we would be reverent people as we enter Holy Week, here is a question that this story asks of us. Who are we being called to see? If you are prone to see yourself as less worthy or as unworthy of God or anyone else. Friends, hear the good news. This story invites you to see yourself as God does. You are encircled by God's grace already because that is just how God operates in the world. God knows, understands, forgives, and welcomes you to God's table just as Jesus welcomed this woman. The hymn is right. Grace 
really is amazing. And if you are prone to be bound by the rules of society or of church, prone to stereotype or judge, to be so certain about others that you have become blind, this story calls you to see differently, to see as Jesus did as he sat at Simon's table. Who needs you to see them truly? Who is crying out for you not to look away? Friends, the story of Jesus tells us that being holy requires that we see, that we pay attention. May we heed its call as we stand on the cusp of Holy Week. Thanks be to God and amen.